Welcome to episode 25 of the Hunt Backcountry Podcast, presented by Exo Mountain Gear. We're getting ready to dive into part two with Ben Gatormson, but first, Tom Gary, you're this week's episode swag giveaway winner. If you want to enter these weekly giveaways, all you have to do, listeners, is leave us a review on iTunes or shoot us an email with your questions or feedback to podcast at exomountaingear.com. All right, if you missed part one with Ben, go check that out. It's episode 24. Right now, let's dive straight into episode 25, part two, with Ben Gatormson. The Hunt Pack Country Podcast is proudly brought to you by Exo Mountain Gear, makers of ultralight, ultra tough packs that are designed to do what you love most hunt the backcountry. Exo Packs are designed for efficiency, simplicity, and durability that's backed by a lifetime warranty. To learn more about Exo Mountain Gear, please visit www.exomountaingear.com. One thing I don't, you know, think gets considered enough, in particular, particularly when making a move in a, a stalking scenario, is sort of light and shadows. Um, mm-hmm. What what's been your experience in terms of how those um, affect your ability to get in on game? I, if you can be in a shadow, I'm there. I'm I'm in that shadow. Um, I mean, you 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 look at the sun and the position of the sun as a as a huge advantage or disadvantage, you know, if, if, uh, if you've ever antelope hunted, um, and you, you know, let's, let's say you're, you're driving up this drainage on this two track and it's in the morning and the, you're looking to the West and the sun is at, you know, it's, it's seven or eight o'clock. You can see antelope three miles away, like neon signs, little blips all over the place. And you come to that same spot at five o'clock and six o'clock in the afternoon and look that same direction and you can't see anything. And it's hard to even see them with optics at that distance. Mm -hmm. And I look at that, I mean, I, you know, in, in my antelope hunting and stuff like that, I'd notice that. So I position myself for hunting. So I'm glassing with the sun at my back in the mornings. And vice, you know, same thing in the evenings. I I don't ever want to glass into the sun. So if my eyes, you know, work that way, animals' eyes have to be the same. So anytime I'm making an approach, if I can, number one, if I can be in a shadow, that's huge. Number two, if, if I can put the sun at my back and still have the wind, I feel like that's a, that's a significant advantage because, you know, animals don't have anything to help avert from you know sun flare you know they don't have a baseball hat they can wear they don't have sunglasses and if you've ever looked into the sun you're walking up a hill when the sun is low in the sky um it's it's hard to see anything uh, um a, a cool uh, a cool hunt i did with a buddy of mine matt um a couple years ago these elk had been so pressured up in the hills they moved down into these antelope they are these these flats these sage flats wide open sage flats and uh i was helping him try to get a bull and we we moved in on this herd that was bedded down and there was one bull he was about a 300 class bull nice six point and then he had about 30 35 cows with him and it's like so many eyeballs you're not going to get close to get a shot at that bull until they get up and start moving well they got up and they started moving we were within about 100 150 yards and they started moving away from the sun so we slid in behind them and they, they moved up onto this bench that was, I'm not kidding you, like flat, like a football field flat. And it's just sage. And with the sun at our back, um, and we would use our shadow to dictate, you know, where the sun was behind us. So we, we got our shadows pointing directly at that herd. Hmm. And we were able to cross this 300-yard wide flat and we maintained uh, probably 100, 150 yards as these elk, this, this entire herd walked across this, this flat in the wide wow. open without even, you know, they, 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 I'm sure they looked, but 
because when you look at, you know, with, with the sun at your back, if you ever look in the, into, back into the sun, you can't see anything. And, right. um, you know, obviously midday, you're not going to see any advantage in that form. But I feel like low, you know, low sun periods, you know, in the morning, in the evening, it, it makes a huge difference. So it's, it's, uh, if there's a shadow, I'm, I'm using it. If there's, if, you know, if the sun's low and I can put myself, you know, with the, with the sun to my advantage, I definitely will, you know, and, and, and it's all small detail, small details like that. It's, you know, and, and that, that can make or break a hunt. I mean, with, in that scenario with the elk, my, my friend, you know, he's, he's a, he's an experienced rifle hunter and he's, he's done quite a bit of bow hunting, but, um, he was just in awe at like how well that worked. And uh, I mean, I've seen other hunts for antelope and antelope is a really good scenario to, to use the sun to your advantage. Cause you know, you may wait on a buck to, to make a move all day long, but I mean, I've seen, I've seen guys get really close to antelope with the sun at their back and you just use your shadow as a pointer. And you know, you, it's, it's like a, you know, there's a clock to it. Cause you know, there's only about an hour, hour and a half in the evenings or in the mornings that you can do it because it, it, uh, it definitely, definitely is, is something that I, I keep in my, uh, in my back pocket for, you know, an animal that I've been waiting on all day to make a mistake. And sometimes you can get away with, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe what you can get away with using the sun. Yeah. So, I mean, the good thing is you, know, when the sun's <laughs> low, whether it's rising or falling, that tends to be times of animal activity. So exactly. You yep. know, if nothing else, yeah, that window short, but it's also one of the prime times to, mm-hmm. to make a play anyway, you know? Yep. Yep. So. Definitely. <clears throat> so what, what, um, as you're making a stock and an animal catches some sort of movement, looks your direction, uh, what's your play? I mean, do you just freeze in place? Um, how do you assess when to move, um, after the animal has looked your way? I mean, what does that change for you and how does that affect your game plan? You know, when it, when it comes to, you know, you're going to get busted by animals and, Really, the only thing that you can you can do is is hold still. I mean, we've all been there, you know. I mean, there's 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 always those scenarios where that animal catches you. And I, I can can tell you um, one thing that I've added that I use every opportunity that I have is, um, and this this sounds like a plug, but it's it's truly one of the most effective pieces of equipment that I carry with me when it comes to spot and stock. And that is, uh, the 3d leafy suit that we have. And, you know, I don't always wear the pants, but I, I, I'm always wearing the jacket and I'm always wearing that face mask, you know, I mean, it seems like covering your face and, and having a little bit of realism to your shape. Um, the slightest breeze will move the, um, the uh, the leaf the die cut leaves on the suit and it seems like oh I you know from from a, from an antelope's perspective or a deer's perspective oh I, I saw something move and they look and then they see that little bit of flutter in that leaf mm-hmm. and I've so many times had animals just go right back to feeding that normally I mean they busted me moving they look hard and I mean you're like oh man the gig's up and then boom, right back to feeding. Yeah. Cause so, a six foot tall hunter moving is one thing, but a little bit of leaf movement is so mm-hmm. natural to what they're used to seeing. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah. even if it's not perfect or, or, or doesn't look exactly like the bush next to you, you know, I mean, I've been in Sage a lot and I haven't seen much on Sage move as far as leaves go, you know, but it seems like, Oh, they've seen that before. You know, I mean, there's, there's different bushes and stuff and, and that, single item um i i mean i wear it when i'm in a tree stand i wear it when i'm you know hunting antelope uh if i have it with me i'm putting it on for elk hunting uh it's not really light you know not really heavy it's pretty lightweight so it's easy to pack it's i mean it just it's a little bulky but um it's i mean both my elk this year i killed a nice bull in montana i killed a nice bull in idaho this year um both of those I had it on. Um, I've, I've killed every antelope I've killed the last two years wearing them. And you, it, it's, it's like the next level, you know, it's, it's like you can put regular camo on 
and you, you, you know, in the, I wear ASAT. So, I mean, I get away with a little bit, I think more than the average camo, but then you, you go to that leafy suit. It's like that, that next step. So it's, it's one of those things that, um, it's always, I mean, I just throw it in the lid of my pack and, you know, I mean, if I'm hunting way, way back, I mean, I'll still try to find space for it. Cause it, I mean, like I said, it doesn't weigh a ton. And, and I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible what that's, what that's helped me get away with. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I don't think I've ever actually worn one, but I've, I've never heard a bad thing about them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm told every year, I mean, I have got, I mean, there's, there's, there's like closet ASAT guys out, you know, in, in our, in our industry, you know, in, in the hunting industry that, and, and on more than one occasion, I've had guys tell me, yeah, you know, and these are guys that are on predominant pro staffs for, for, you know, ASAT's competitors, you know, some of the better camo manufacturers and, and you know what, I mean, they're like, yeah, you know, I, I put that leafy suit on and, um, man, it's, it's the best thing that I've ever worn, you know, <laughs> and, and I mean, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus and say any names or anything like that, but it's, it's just one of those things that, um, it, you know, for a while, like leafy suits in general have kind of died off and, and nobody really gives them a second look. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's, it's with me everywhere I go and no matter what species, I mean, if I, if I ever hunt anything, you know, like a goat or a sheep or something like that, you know, I'm going to try to do it with my bow and I'm going to. I'm going to have it with me. I mean, it's, it's proven itself time and time again for me. So yeah, that's cool. <clears throat> Definitely. So another thing I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on, I mean, you know, as hunters, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, what we've talked about, camouflage, concealment, using cover, um, obviously thermals and wind and things like that. What about reading animals behavior? Cause that certainly plays into, um, you know, making a successful stock and, you know, helping to dictate how you approach any particular situation with an animal. So what particular cues or giveaways have you sort of learned or picked up on um, from different species throughout your years hunting them? You know, I mean, you, you, you try as, as, as much as you can to, you know, keep the, you know, when, when it comes to putting a stock on, you know, an animal that's alarmed or, an animal that's, that's, you know, had that, that say for instance, just got bumped by somebody, you know, I mean, antelope is a, is an excellent example. Um, I hunt all public land with my antelope stuff and, um, you know, on occasion I have other hunters come through and they, they push animals and it almost seems like it takes, you know, it, almost the, the, the better part of an afternoon for, for a, a herd of antelope to, um, to really settle down. And, and, you know, with, with my experience with deer and stuff like that, you know, outside of the rut, they're, they're on point and they're, they're going to move to an area that you can't see them if they're, if they're pushed a lot. But when it comes to, you know, whitetails and, and, and stuff like that too, I mean, you can read body language as, as much as you can. And, you know, if an animal's onto you, when you, when you get ready to make a shot, if it's, even even at 40 yards, I mean, even with the performance of today's bows, I mean, an alarmed animal at 40 yards, I'm always nervous about shooting at anything that's alarmed, you know, unless it's like 20 yards or less. So, um, but when it comes to, you know, animals and reading behavior and stuff like that, I mean, it's it's difficult to do because you, you never know what what's going on in their head. You can only, you know take what you've seen and mm. uh you know the the bull i killed in idaho i was i was hunting with a good friend of mine uh kevin anderson from ripcord and uh you know we we had this this plan in mind and he went up and because i had made the play that morning on the herd and and uh i'm like well they're moving kind of up this draw across and uh he he moved up and around and i said why don't you go up and get on the other side of them and um uh, let's let's just i'm gonna sit down here if they come my way i'm here if they go your way you're up there and you know we almost had them surrounded we had the wind good from both locations and um the bull i killed in in idaho he he went up and around and got in position and i don't know what ended up happening but something ended up pushing that herd of elk and that bull back into the the timber you know they 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 kind of went up 
onto that other side hill. And they didn't know what it was. They couldn't smell it. But it made some of the cows nervous, and and uh, they ran up there. And and then, you know, it was enough to push them about 100 yards across the hill, and then they'd stop. And, they, you know, then it turned into a, okay, now we're watching our 6 o'clock. And they, they stood there, and they stood there for probably 45 minutes to an hour looking in the direction of whatever had alarmed them. Wow. Now, these elk hadn't been pressured at all. This was opening day in Idaho. And they slowly started to feed back out, you know, after, after 45 minutes of sitting there looking, I think we saw something, but I don't know. They, you know, and all you got to do is you spook that one cow of that 30 animal herd and it, it that one cow is going to boogie and they're all going to follow. Well, it wasn't convincing enough. Maybe it wasn't a matriarchal cow, a mature cow. Maybe it was a calf and it took them back under the, the opposite hillside. And that's when that bull came out. And then he's like, I'm going to start looking for a spot to water because I'm thirsty. And then he came down and I was in a position where I was able to drop down. And, and he, he, I mean, he was part of that herd. He, he hadn't, he wasn't the one that was spooked, but, um, you know, you got to keep in mind too, that, you know, uh, it was, it was late August. It was the 30th of August and his mind was a little muddled. You know, he was thinking about passing his jeans on and, you know, the cows were a little more cautious. He was one of the first ones out that, you know, after they'd kind of gone onto that opposite hill, he came out and started going down towards that water. So, you know, I mean, you definitely take an animal's, you know, body language into, into consideration. But, um, you know, when it comes to, to being able to read their body language, I mean, I, I look at body language when it comes to like decoying as a, as a huge way to, I mean, if you, if you're watching a, a group of mule deer say, and this kind of is a little off track of what you asked Mark, but, um, I look at body language as to if I should use a decoy or not, if I have that in my arsenal at that moment in time. And, um, you know, if it's, the, if the time and date is right and you know, the animals are rutting and, um, uh, I killed a, I killed a buck this year in Indiana from the ground using a heads up decoy and, I'm willing to bet that if I would have walked into a, a bow shop and told a guy, hey, yeah, I, I used this and I killed that buck, they would have laughed at me. <laughs> yeah. You know, using using techniques like that. And I, I, I've used those, those, those heads-up decoys on turkeys. You get a, 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 a tom by himself. I had a turkey about run me over using one of those. I got flustered and I got my release tied up in my um my rangefinder tether and ended up missing the the turkey but he he came in to like 15 yards like ready to kick my butt using that that decoy system and and it's it's body language like that you know i mean i've had mule deer come in um when you get a, a buck that's pushing smaller bucks off um i killed a a, a nice mule deer in north dakota uh, several years ago, and I was basically shadowing his group of deer. I mean, he was the dominant buck, and he had two or three smaller bucks um, that kept working in, and he was just this big, tough bully and um, would run them off. He'd run them off probably 100, 150 yards, and then he'd work back in on the does, you know, kind of showing off a little bit. And what ended up on that deer was I, I worked in, I, I, was, I was in some buttes, and I, I kind of came around this little kind of mud hill and he heard me he heard me he didn't see me he heard me and this this guy was so rutted up and so adamant about keeping these small bucks out of there he he looked at the noise he heard from me as a challenging deer and he came and he marched around this thing he was all bristled up and you know and i shot him at 18 yards i mean it's it's one of those scenarios you just you know you 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 love those close shots like that. I mean, it's let that animal come to you. So, and same thing on that Indiana whitetail I killed this year. I mean, I got to 50 yards. I popped up the decoy, that heads up decoy, and I grunted to try to get his attention. And he was bedded right next to a doe on a field edge. That's how I had seen him. I was coming in to pull a stand. It was the last day I was going to hunt and I was going to 
get on the road early to, to start the long drive back to Montana. And, uh, here there's a doe that's bedded out in the sun and I look and I see her, she's like four or 500 yards across this field. And I could see a really white rack right behind her in the grass. You know, he was in the shade, but he, I know he was there. So I went around, got the wind right, popped up and, uh, totally, you know, gave him that heads up decoy. He, he saw it after I finally snore wheezed. He got up out of his bed. He and I, w- I was in an oak flat. I mean, it was. If you guys have ever experienced hunting whitetails in like a you know mature oak stand in November, it's like walking around on cornflakes. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. You're 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 not going to get close. And this is this is an excellent example of using, you know, these tools to 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 get that animal to to finish that stock and come to you. And Mm -hmm. I got up to the point where I could see him. I snort wheezed. He stood up out of his bed, started posturing immediately, bristled up, ears laid back. I mean, just like you see on those videos. And he ended up working back and forth and kind of did like a zigzag pattern. He he scraped the ground a bunch. And it's one of those things if I, I I mean, I wish I would have had like a a video camera to video it. I mean, I remember it so vividly. It's awesome. But he ended up working into the trees to 25 yards and I – I shot him at 25 yards and I think decoys are, are overlooked and, uh, that, uh, that system that, that heads up has with the, the bow mount and, the um, the different decoys. He, I mean, I have, I think I have one of every decoy he makes and it's always with me. I mean, you, you never know the scenario that you're going to, you're going to use it. And before that, before that even came out, there were scenarios that I can, I can look back and, um, in North Dakota, I had a, a really big five by five that was just tending this doe like crazy. And I, I got to 80 yards and was waiting him out and the doe bedded down and he was just standing right over the top of her. I know if I would have had a decoy that I could have mounted onto my bow, like that heads up, if I would have popped a buck decoy up, he'd have come and I'd have had to shoot him in self-defense, I bet. And it's just, you know, those scenarios are they're out there and if you hunt enough you'll you'll start to see you'll start to notice those scenarios and 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 having every tool that you can possibly use to use in your advantage is is the way to go so have you ever had to go bad uh for you with a decoy uh, where the decoys you know um maybe challenged an animal and they they fled instead of coming in oh yeah yep absolutely um you you know more on antelope i I uh, I hunted really hard with the decoy two years ago with for antelope, and I had one buck in mind. And uh, I mean, every stock I was taking it with, but I wasn't I wasn't reading what was in front of me. I wasn't reading that that uh, uh, that animal's body language correctly. I mean, he he had a couple smaller bucks with him in the herd, and it's like, okay, well, if I come in with this small decoy. You know, and I I got in several times, and and with antelope I've 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 gotten in too close. You know, you, you think, well, I mean, how is that possible? You know, getting in too close with a decoy. Well, keep in mind that the closer you are, the more detail they can see. Yeah. And uh, um, you know, I've I moved in, and the does the does you know I pop you pop the decoy up, and the does are like, oh, you know, what's that? You know, and then they start coming in, but the buck is on the other side of the heard and before you know it the does are spooking and then if the does spook it's over you know it's and it's 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 the same for anything i mean live by the does during that breeding period so um if you can just show that buck the decoy sometimes it'll work and you know i I killed an antelope with that same decoy system in montana here two years ago and um i was about 250 to 300 yards away I had the sun at my back, like we talked about. I moved in. Um, they started feeding across this, you know, the open side of this big open gully. And the buck saw me and started like raking a bush. And that's that's a that's an that's an indicator. He's like, okay, he's trying to assert his dominance. He's, mm-hmm. he's he sees you, and it took him a while to see me. I was I was far enough away, but when he finally saw me. He started raking a bush and then he'd stop. And if you ever watch antelope rake a bush, it's, it's kind of funny because they, they'll rake really hard and then they'll, they'll snap their head up, their neck up and they'll look right at you. It's, it's, 
kind of funny. And then he would do that. And then I took the decoy and I did the same thing with the decoy. I'd, I'd take it down and I'd, you know, rake a, the little sage bush I was hiding behind and then I'd snap it up. Hmm. So I would, I'm, I was mocking You're what mi- he was doing. Mimicking, yeah. And, you know, it's the same situation that you're seeing these guys, you know, when they bugle at a bull, when he bugles at them, trying to, you know, entice that animal to come and say, hey, man, I'm the tough guy. You you should shut up. You know, it's 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 the whole language thing that that, you know, it's it seems like nobody has it figured out. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, once you kind of onto something and that with that antelope, I just I mocked him. It was probably 15 minutes and and he would rake a bush and he'd walk 20 yards closer and then rake another bush. And then he'd walk 20 yards closer. And then he got to about 150 yards and then he ran at me. Yeah. And I'm, I was scrambling. I'm like, Oh crap. You know, I need to get by a bush that'll conceal my legs and my lower body. You know, um, I always tried to pop the decoy up when I had something that would conceal me, you know, just this random walking around decoy head and shoulders, it doesn't look right, but if you pop it up over the ridge of a hill and you can't right. see the animal's legs, that's, I mean, that's all, that's the little details that make some of these, these pieces of equipment work so well. So, yeah, but yeah, that, and now I've had a ton of fun with that system. It's, you know, when, when you're, you're kind of out of ideas and, and you, you, you're into that scenario, you know, I'd been tree stand hunting back in Indiana and I, I saw that buck and I had that decoy with me. I'm like, Oh man, this is perfect. And I got in there and I, I had to work in so slow because of how noisy the leaves were. And the, and he was on the edge of a field. So I had to come in from that timber side and he came to me the rest of the way. So it's, it's a blast. So yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> there's, it's, uh, it's white tails are so skittish. And as you mentioned, usually the conditions are just incredibly unfavorable to get on them from the ground. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, it's just incredibly, incredibly difficult. So that's very cool. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I mean, it's your ambush. I still think is the most effective when it comes to white tails and really any species. If you can have the wind right and an ambush an animal that at a pinch point, I mean, there's nothing better than that. Um, you know, my Montana bull this year, um, I, I watched a group of elk, and it didn't include this bull that I ended up shooting, but I watched this group of elk you know, come through and it's, that's, that's a totally different style. Ambush style is, and you learn that, you know, tree stand hunting and stuff. And those tactics work so effectively. It's not the most exhilarating. It doesn't lend itself to, to the, to the most fun story, you know, like verbally re- interacting with these animals via calls. <laughs> like I sat there and, and waited for four hours and then they came. Well, great yeah, story. Exactly. Yeah. But you know, you have to have it in your scenario. I mean, it's, it's part of being a successful hunter. There's times that that's, that's what you got to do. So, yeah. So Ben, I'm curious is, is somebody who hunts multiple species, elk, you know, mule deer, antelope, bear, white tail, turkey. I mean, you just kind of hit it all. Um, what do you think is the value to that specifically? And what I'm getting at is, I mean, so many guys are, you know, focused on a species or maybe a couple species, but have you found that, you know, hunting turkey has made you a better elk hunter and hunting antelope has made you a better deer hunter, um, you know, since you're kind of doing the whole gamut there? Yeah, honestly, yeah. I mean, everything relates in the end. You're, you're, you're hunting. I mean, the majority of the bulk of the details might be different, but there's little things, you know, I think the patience game I've learned from tree stand hunting. And when I travel back to Minnesota or the Midwest, Indiana, Illinois, wherever, and I'm going to do a, a whitetail hunt in the rut, the most effective way to hunt is to sit in a tree stand and be patient. You know, if it's all day long, I, I, I mean, bring a book or something like that. I mean, I'm, I'm as ADD as they come when it comes to stuff. So I get fidgety really mm-hmm. easy and I still enjoy that type of hunting because it's so incredibly effective. Um, that animal is moving in your direction in, you know, coming through your area and you have everything in your favor. You have the, the only thing you don't have control over is like the wind for that particular time frame and stuff like that. But if you, if you look at the habits of that animal and I feel like that skill helps me with everything, helps me with elk. It helps me with antelope. Um, 
And another thing too that that is huge. I I mean I take advantage of every season that I can. I mean I'm my favorite animal to hunt is what's in season, and I can tell you that going from a species like antelope, bow hunting antelope, spot and stock. When you transition to elk, you feel like you could line dance in front of an elk. <laughs> when it comes to how much of their defense is is dictated by vision, um, I mean stuff that you wouldn't dream. I mean it makes you a better stalker when it comes to stalking an animal. Antelope are the most challenging. It's the most frustrating animal to hunt with a bow sometimes, but it's also one of the most rewarding. And um, in Montana here, we start August, uh, mid-August, August 15th, and um, we have two weeks, two, sometimes three weeks before our, our other big game species start. Our other big game, elk and deer, they start uh, that first week in September. So... Um, I love antelope hunting. It's it's one of one of my favorite things to do, and it's like you say, it's it's it makes you a better stalker in general. You know, when it comes to spot and stock, um, you know, spot and stock deer, you have a lot more terrain to use. You know, with antelope, a lot of times where they're located is out in the middle of of a sage flat. So okay, now what do you do? I'm like, well, you, your first step is to get within, you know, that. 400 yard mark without them seeing you and then it's like okay now we got to get to 200 yards and if it's a belly crawl if it's using a a swale that you can't even see from from a glassing position i mean it's it's crazy stuff and when you start to to spot and stock hunt wide open flat terrain you know you you look at you know areas with lots of terrain you're like oh man that'd be easy you know it's it's amazing and antelope. I mean, anybody that wants to spot and stalk and learn how to do it, spend some time chasing antelope. And you know, there's no trees. There's very seldom rocks and boulders and stuff like that. And you get up in a high country mule deer. There's there's boulders. There's trees. There's timber pockets. There's all this stuff you can use to your advantage. And you know, you start to see these small details kind of come out when you start to do that. So it's very good. Mm-hmm. Cool. Definitely. So what do you feel, uh, maybe a lesson from this past season or just kind of something that you're still working on and still need to improve on as a hunter? You know, it's always being adaptive, you know, always learning. Um, I've, I've previously been, a, a really, really enjoying like calling elk, for example. And every year I, I, you know, I, I buy, 20 or 30 reeds and I'd, I'd have my favorite four or five that I'd carry around with me. And, and, uh, and this year, um, I hunted new areas that were more open that I didn't rely on calling for. And, uh, um, I mean, I, I've learned that you have to go with your gut sometimes. Um, you know, my experience with my Montana bull this year, um, I, 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 was hunting him the night before I hunted, I hunted that bull. I spotted him that morning and I was hunting him in the evening that, that following evening. And I was working in on him. I over pursued the ridge he was on and where he had bedded and, uh, um, got to the end of that ridge and, and was distracted by elk that were bugling in the bottom of the, the draw that was to the North of me. And I thought, Oh man, I bumped him and I should have, I should dive in there after him. And, and I thought, ah, I don't know, you know, and then I started working back up toward where camp was and, um, I didn't want to get, you know, too far from camp, you know, and have to walk back, you know, three or four miles in the dark. But I, uh, I got back on that ridge, started back, heading back, back towards, uh, towards camp so I could stay high on my way back. And lo and behold, he popped out and he was between me and the direction I was heading. So I started to, to follow him and I, I followed him and, and I did, I ended up bumping him. Um, I was calling and trying to get him to come back. Like I, I was throwing some lost cow calls out there and then I, I, I felt pressured cause I was running out of light and I bugled a couple times and, um, I was hoping that he'd, he'd just come charging in. And of course he didn't. And, uh, this is, again, this is the patience thing. It just instilled that idea of patience and I bumped him, but I bumped him in the direction that he was heading to feed for the night. And, uh, 
I ended up working back, got back to camp, um, and uh, made the decision to to go back, thinking that I would catch him coming back into that same saddle crossing that he had come out through and uh, on that ridge. And um, I got way ahead of him. I was way ahead of him, and I was waiting for him to come in. And my my initial spot that I stopped and set up. You know, so he's coming back, and as his cow started to come back towards me, he started bugling, and I'm set up. And then my wind is, is you know, coming from him to me kind of across a little bit. I bet you I changed positions where my setup was. I bet I changed. I mean, this is an, an exaggeration, but I, I probably changed 20 times in the amount of time it took him to cover about 400 yards. <laughs> I, I, I went back up to the top of the ridge where the saddle was, and then I moved down. <laughs> like, well, what if he goes down the hill and he's below me? Because it, the, I'm the ridge the had only a real one that does that. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the ridge had a real progressive crown, so it was kind of flat on the top. But then, it, as you, you got off that top, it got steeper and steeper. So I couldn't couldn't have a shot down there. I mean, you, you're never going to be able to shoot everywhere. And after I did this and I, I moved my initial setup, he would have come probably 30 yards by me, wow. you know, 20 or 30 yards by me. And my wind would have been good. I would have had perfect wind, but in the, you know, the spot I ended up with when I finally saw him and I wasn't able to relocate for a 21st time, he's, he's coming back. He's coming across. And I had one small opening where I could see across the top of the ridge back in the direction that I had set up originally. And he stopped in that opening and hmm. gave me a 55-yard shot. And, I mean, I I hit him right where you needed to. And, I mean, it, it was pure luck. Because if I if I'd have walked towards him 10 or 15 yards, I would have gained enough elevation where there would have been lower overhanging branches. Yeah. I was just far enough, and if I would have stayed where I was initially, um, I'd, I'd have had a, a much easier shot, and you know, and, and everything worked out in the end. But you know, it was just one of those situations where you get, you know, when you're trying to set up on an animal, just stay where you are. You know, when you're fumbling around trying to reset up, trying, oh man, I can't shoot down there. Well, I need to move down. Oh, then I can't shoot up here. All that's going to do is you're going to you're going to ruin that scenario because that animal's going to come within sight of of where you are, see you through some trees or something, and he's going to go the other way. You already know he's coming. Just stay put. If he goes down there, guess what? He wins this scenario. But chances are you might be able to slip around and get on him again. Yeah. So it's like you gotta you gotta take in as much information as you can, but you ultimately have to make a decision and then commit to it. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Well, I feel like we've been drinking through a fire hose in terms of learning little tips and tactics, and it's been great. Um, before we want to wrap up, you know, I know from visiting with you at ATA that, you know, ASAT, not just again, as we kind of talked about before, is the pattern, but ASAT, ASAT in terms of the products, you guys have some new and exciting stuff coming out for 2016. So we'd yeah. certainly love to get the scoop on uh, on what's new and what we can expect. Definitely. We're... Uh you know, we're, we're, we've been working on stuff now for two years, um, and uh, we, we've, we've got a really killer technical system that we're, we're going to have out this year. Um, it's going to start, you know, base layers. We're doing merino wool now, and I know First Light does merino wool too, and they've done a really good job with their merino too, but we feel like still there aren't enough people using merino and, and know the advantages of it. I mean... We looked for the first year I was at ASET, I experimented with with other products, you know, different things that, you know, trying to be more on the proactive side, trying to find the next best thing. It seemed like Merino, everybody was doing it. And I, I you know, I wasn't able to find anything that, that compared, you know, you get, you get that natural, you know, body regulating temperature wise. So that's one of the products we're going to have, you know, the, the, uh, that we're going to have a base layer series, you know, a crew, a quarter zip, a quarter zip hooded. Um, and then we're going to move into uh, some real technical soft shells. We have a nylon pant. Um, and, you know, I've taken, you know, I've worn mountaineering gear and I've worn, you know, a lot of other stuff when it comes to 
Um, you know, I, I, I was wearing non camel stuff for a long time just to try to find, you know, what, what the best cut for, for hunting is and what the best material is and trying to, you know, bridge the gap between it. And, you know, in the end there's, there's a, there's, there's a ton of new stuff that we have and it's, we got a killer soft shell system. And then, you know, we're going to revamp some of our older products, you know, the classic series for the guys that maybe aren't you know, aren't going to spend, you know, three to $500 on a system, mm-hmm. you know, the guys that, that, uh, that get out there and they get after it. And then, and, you know, it's just too much money. You know, I mean, it's a small niche in, in the industry that spends a lot of money and we want to focus on our, our more budget oriented hunters as well. So, so you're going to see a lot of that stuff. And you know what, if you, uh, um, like I said, you know, earlier in the podcast, if you want the the single best thing that I've found, it's that leafy suit. Um, I mean, if I if I was unemployed tomorrow and I continued to hunt and I wore out all my camo, I would put a pair of blue jeans on and a earth tone colored sweatshirt, whatever, and I would put that leafy suit over it. And I feel like I I mean I wouldn't be as comfortable, but I feel like I I would I would have the concealment necessary to have every advantage in my favor. So. Yeah. But yeah, we got a new website that just launched too. So, um, you know, if you, you haven't been over to that, asatcamo.com, I have a couple of the pieces on there now. And then as we get some of the newer pieces in, we're going to be adding them. And a lot of that stuff, the delivery dates are going to be, you know, anywhere from May to July on that stuff. So, okay. Yeah, you were kind of breaking uh, up. You said May to July. We're going to you know, use social media and stuff. Some of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, May to July, depending on well, – I've got a bunch of stuff that's that's ordered now that we should have, you know, late spring to uh, to mid-summer. So. Yeah. So is there a good way for uh, guys to stay up to date as those new items get added and things like that? Yeah, check the website. Check our social media. Um uh, our, our Facebook page, our, our Instagram, we're going to definitely be posting stuff like that. And we're actually going to start, uh, start throwing some stuff out to, you know, different, uh, dealers and stuff like that to do reviews. So you'll start seeing some of that stuff. Um, you know, I know you guys are big ASAP fans. We'll make sure you you guys are on the list when we start getting some of this new stuff in. I mean, if there's a particular piece that, that you want to try or something, uh, we'll, we'll get it out to you and then have you guys give us some feedback and stuff like that. And, We'll go from there. So that's awesome, man. Sounds great. And where can uh, listeners kind of not only follow ASAP, but are you on social media and all those fun places that yeah, you know, guys um, can check you out? Definitely. Um, ben Gatormson. I mean, my name's hard uh, to spell, but I'll, it's uh, Ben G U T T O R M S O N. I'm on Facebook. I've got an Instagram page. Um, I'm not super active on it. You know, I just I don't want to. I don't want to bring bad attention. You know what I mean? It seems like there's so many internet scouters out there. I've seen a lot of articles, people getting burned by, you know, stuff like that. So I, 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 like you say earlier, I, I kind of fly under the radar. I try not to try not to, you know, throw too much out there, too much information, but you know, I love getting out there and, and, uh, and I, it's any animal that's in season. That's what I'm doing. So, yeah, that's awesome. Well, Ben, we certainly appreciate your time and thanks for, you know, sharing so much of what you've learned with us to help us cut that learning curve even shorter and be more successful in the field. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, guys. As always, guys, I want to thank you so much for listening. Be sure to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever else you might be listening to this or contact us by email with your feedback or questions at podcast at exomountaingear.com.